Hi, Chris. Thanks for the curse. Oh, yeah, figured I'd just dive right in this time. And I need to stress right out the gate that this is one of the most normal songs here. Oh, right, the reason we're here is because I asked my viewers to send me weird songs to review. 41 of them, to be exact. And then I filled out the last nine spots by asking a few friends to send me some weird stuff and adding a little bit of extra chaos in myself. See if you can spot the imposters. Which, speaking of, hot in the airport. Hello, Or, well, I guess it's unfair to call Wide Beckhurst an imposter because he's truly one of a kind. Like in the way the Shags are. Music made by people who just do not know what they're doing at all. Which is fascinating in its own way. Like, this guy has no sense of rhythm, no knowledge of music theory, and can barely sing, yet because of how repetitive and how long the song is, it manages to be maddeningly catchy anyways. Like, after enough listens, I do kinda get it. How I assume the song came into existence is that Beckhurst recorded all these tracks separately and then tried to sync them up later, but because they were all recorded as separate tracks at different tempos, they just didn't line up no matter how hard he tried. So we just said, eh, frick it. Which is less fun than the non-chemistry of the Shags, but it is ingenuity in its own way. Or at least in my imaginary scenario here it is. It's not like we know anything about this guy other than that he's probably Hispanic, so... And part of why this works, which yes, I do think it does, is that it's just so earnest. Dude totally believed in himself, even when nobody else did. It's cute, and way more fun than parent who forced their kids to record some songs, too. I know I'm making the comparison a lot, but like, how could I not? You've heard the song. Tonight! Right on, you crazy vaquero. Boy howdy, that sure was a way to start, huh? Anyways, number 49 is a carefully arranged modern classical piece. And also a YouTube poop. I mean, I kid, but also, I'm right, aren't I? Like, the way the Garden of Love chops up that one poetry sample almost as if it's taking the piss out of it, but like, in a loving way. It's silly, it's playful, it has a surprisingly good sense of humor, even for as, like, stiff and tightly composed as the rest of it is. Which, like, yeah, beyond that, I don't really get a ton out of this, so... My bird brain is probably just not big enough for this kind of stuff. That, and it's kinda dry. I can tell there's all sorts of melodies and harmonies going on here, and there's a few parts that are kind of jaunty, but I mostly feel like I'm listening to a performance rather than a song. Not much in the way of build or progression, no dynamic shifts, no real emotions. I'd probably like it a bit more if it was a bit shorter, I guess. By, like, the three minute mark, I feel like I've gotten the point. It's fine, just not quite for me. And unfortunately, it's time for the biggest disappointment of this entire set. Like, okay, Unstoppable Force is cool, don't get me wrong. There's a real spooky vibe to this one. Nay, it's like, actually kinda scary. The jagged strings, the atonal synths, the whisper growled vocals, there's a real atmosphere set here. But that's, like, all the song has. It's interesting, but it feels like it should be doing more. The entire song is, like, way too much buildup for not really any payoff. It kinda tries at the end, but even that accelerating tempo bit kinda just goes nowhere. Honestly, I like this one less every time I listen to it. It's had by far the biggest falloff of any song in this set, which is a shame because there's so much potential here, I just don't think the execution works. Shame. <laughs> This next song poses a tough question that I still struggle to answer. How do you rate a song that's only half good? I put my pride to the side just to get degraded. I wouldn't mind all the lies, but you complicated. Blonde Ambition reminds me a lot of that Billy Wood song from last time that I didn't really get much out of. Ambient rap that's probably more about the message than the tune itself. And how if I can tell you what the message is here, because I can't even find the lyrics this time. I guess it's cute how much fun they're having with pitch shifting at least. Honestly, if this were just the front half, it'd probably be at the very bottom of this ranking. Thankfully, it isn't. Yeah, 
Yeah, the back half has this whole like post rock thing going on almost. A mellow instrumental with layers of vocals and noisy guitar squeals that slowly creep in, threatening to overstuff the mix until it breaks. It builds up with the first half established pretty well and it's pretty compelling to listen to, but I mean, I do have to sit through that entire first half to get to it, so can only give this one so much credit. Now, if you want to hear a song that's noisy and claustrophobic the entire way through, Daddy is an inherently terrible word, and I'm glad that Aphex Twin recognizes that and plays into that uncomfy daddy pappy mix. But also, he did still use the word, so uh, half credit. And yeah, this is obviously meant to sound uncomfortable and uncanny, and in that regards, great work. I dig me a good drum and bass groove, and the scuzzy industrial sound is pretty cool, but the sound itself doesn't really change all that much across its four minute runtime. Like, Aphex Twin is great at drum sequencing. This is a song where the lead instrument is the drums, but that's just the thing. Drums are, well, percussion. It's really hard for them to carry an entire song, no matter how cool they are. And the more you hear a song designed to make you uncomfortable, the more comfortable with it you get. So, neat song, but you can do better in this lane. So, not to get too far off topic, but y'all know Sean Fei Wolf of Diamond Axe Studios rating scale, right? It goes from 0 to 5, in theory, but then there's the exceptional tiers. Songs that break that scale in one way or another. A song too good to be called merely excellent is exceptional plus. A song so bad it goes beyond terrible is exceptional minus. But what about songs that break the scale in other ways? <laughs> Songs that are just impossible to rate on a 0 to 10 scale for one reason or another. The songs so far removed from what we consider normal music that they just make you go, what? Well, I think those songs deserve their own exceptions too. And so, ladies and gentlemen, creatures and constructs and anyone else who will listen, I now proudly present to you all the exceptional equals tier. <laughs> Behold, staple tapeworms on my penis by Passenger of Shit. Am I Jeff Hoobastank? Because this feels like hell mode. Like, okay, I can tell what this is. It's an obviously goofy and insane joke song that's probably bad on purpose, but like in a fun way. Rubbery synths playing a silly melody, paired up with death metal vocals and speed chord drums. With lyrics about, actually, besides the title line, I couldn't really tell you. For the sake of my own personal enjoyment, I have opted out of looking up any lyrics I could not make out myself. I'm happier that way. <laughs> And okay, I'm sort of playing up the what the hell is of this song a little because I don't think I'm supposed to take any of it seriously. But the funny thing is, there's songs that sound a lot like this way higher up on this ranking. Honestly, I think my only real problem with this song is that it's a bit too goofy. I guess this is as far as you have to go to get me to not be over the moon for a speedcore song. I respect the hell out of this though, which is an incredibly funny thing to say about a song called Staple Tapeworms on My Penis. <laughs> Okay, so for no particular reason, I'm gonna start listing off some of my favorite birds. Crows, obviously, and ravens. Big fan of foggers and hawks, too. Ooh, and owls, especially snowy owls. So graceful. Parrots, they're really smart. Have you heard of the bower bird? The let, let me, me smash smell. bird, as you may know them? They build really cool nests and collect blue things as part of an elaborate mating ritual. Which, speaking of birds with fascinating mating rituals, swans... <laughs> Oxygen is another song that falls victim to what I'm going to coin as the law of diminishing weirdness, wherein if you do something weird for long enough, it stops being weird pretty fast. Like that brief clip I played? Yeah, that's basically the whole song. I mean, okay, that riff itself is pretty cool, the angular chords and the light jazziness of it especially, and there's a pretty solid level of buildup throughout here, but boy howdy though I wish there was more than one riff. Honestly, the more I listen to this song, the goofier it sounds to me, especially Jira's vocal vamping. He's really excited about breathing. Me too, bestie. I don't think Swan's aesthetic and their uber repetitive nature will ever be quite my thing, even if I do, on a fundamental level, enjoy stuff this noisy and abrasive. But this is just way too little for how long it lasts, and I'm more than ready for it to be done by the time it's over. I'm gonna have to bump Swan's down to a C in my bird tier list, sorry. Oh my god, first Ohio, now Iowa, no state is safe. Just 
generally, I tend to find Vocaloid a bit too texturally unappealing and uncanny to really enjoy, but anytime a song intentionally leads into that uncanniness, it seems to work for me. Bitter Choco Decoration, Happy Song, and now Apricot. Granted, like with the former, I think I'd like this more if it were properly sung, and the whole tune sounds kinda dry between the understated percussion, the robotic vocals, and the mechanical, well, everything really. Like, that one breakdown in the middle is really damn cool, but in a way that kind of overshadows the rest of the song for me. The piano flourishes were neat and weird at first, but once I got used to them, I was left with a song that doesn't sound all that good, isn't particularly catchy, and isn't really even all that weird. I feel like I'm coming down harsher on this one than I mean to, but it's kind of just been a shrink every time I listen to it. It's fine, though. <laughs> The good tier starts eight songs in. Welcome to yet another crow grab bag. Not to be too terminally billboard brain, but like, why would anyone anywhere listen to 6 9 when unintelligible exists? I have no clue who Josiah or NASCAR Aloe are, other than absolute meatheads who made the most tryhard, edge lordy trap metal they could muster, but in like a completely inoffensive way, complimentary. Like, see, you can be this kind of guy without being racist or homophobic or whatever else. Wholesome, undiluted violence puts a smile on my face. The one thing I don't really understand is why chiptune? Really undercuts the intensity of the song. Chiptune by design just doesn't have the edge or breath to go as hard as the song wants. Or at least this particular sound font doesn't. Get me a grungy Genesis sound font and then maybe we'll talk. So the dudes have to carry the song with their voices and they kinda do, but it could have gone harder. And it's the kind of song I really need to be in the right mood for, but damn if it isn't fun as hell when I am in the mood for it. Okay, let me be perfectly clear about something. In narrowing down the list of songs to include in this video, I tried to approach it from the perspective of what would the average pop listener find weird, which leads to scenarios where songs that I find utterly painful and normal are still weird enough by those standards. Case in point... <laughs> This entire segment is going to come off as sounding incredibly mean to a perfectly 7 out of 10 song I find solidly enjoyable, but like, I just can't with this one. Queen of Insanity is just the most meat and potatoes prog metal possible that's only really notable for being sung by a gal and an orc rather than your standard power metal dude, as bog standard and non boundary pushing as prog metal gets, which is still weirder than most genres, but we'll call it the control group for this very experimental set of songs. <laughs> Like, see, the thing about this song is that I can point to the exact Dream Theater songs they're cribbing from. Like, this bit... ...is just a test of something all's intro. And this riff... ...is just the test of something all's chorus riff. And this guitar solo... It's just ripped straight from the test of stuff. Wait a minute! I'm starting to notice a pattern here. And hey, fun fact, the test is something all about a schizophrenic patient. The song I'm reviewing is called Queen of Insanity. Is, is is it intentional? Or did they just subconsciously rip off this song so hard that they accidentally did an oopsie whoopsie in the process? Anyways, the point of all this is that I'm just not exactly hungry for more of this sound when I've already got a better version in the original article, and there's no real surprises to be found here either. Just go listen to old Dream Theater instead, y'all. It's good stuff. You know, I just realized, this entire video is pointless. Why? Well, because art is crap. Or at least my mother told me so. <laughs> oh, okay, but this one's interesting because you'd think this kind of bratty Valley Guard delivery would get on my nerves. I'm very much on record not liking it. But no, I think it works here because it's buried under so many layers of guitar fuzz you can barely tell. And this kind of overwhelming soundscape just tickles my brain real nice. Smiley face. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Having said that, like, that's really all this short two minute snippet of sound really has to offer. Maximum guitars, unhinged vocals, and rigid percussion keeping it somewhat grounded, but not much depth to it. Which I guess does in fact fly in the face of art as a concept to make something this artless and transgressive, but it also means there's not a lot of replay value here. Cool when I'm listening to it, but I'm probably not going to remember for very long after this video goes up. <laughs> Finally, J-Pop the Samples Maroon 5. Okay, but jokes aside, one thing I've learned about modern Japanese culture from exposure is that they friggin' love Western classical music. Otahan Anthem samples several different tunes, obviously, but then there's Hyrule Memory and also Danganronpa using Claire de Luna's essential motif, and if you've ever played any of the older DDR games, there's classical interpolations all over the place there. I don't exactly have the time to do any sort of deep history dive for this video, but I'd love to know the rationale behind that. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what was I talking about? Right, Otahan Anthem by Riyamu Yumemi. This sounds like the theme song to the anime that kills you if you watch it. Just non-stop chaotic energy for four straight minutes. Deranged synth runs, constant classical interpolations, over-enthusiastic lead vocals backed by unhinged crowd chanting, all for a song about how awesome it is to be an otaku. <laughs> And, like, it's probably a minute or so too long, honestly. It goes so hard and has so much energy that it can get a bit exhausting. Especially with the cutesy anime girl voice that I'm just never a big fan of. And there's no new real twist once you're past the first chorus, you kinda just get what you paid for. But I didn't pay a goddamn thing to begin with, so, like, hard to complain. It's still fun as hell. You will die in seven days. <laughs> Speaking of history lessons I'm not equipped to give, uh, so, Japanese net labels. I'll leave it to you, dear viewer, to do the deep dive on the topic, but the reading Wikipedia at you version of it is that it was, and still is, a counterculture movement that started around the turn of the millennium and basically allowed Japanese underground musicians to, like, get noticed at all in defiance of strict industry standards, the end result being a whole scene of music utterly unlike anything else out there. Case in point... Like, on a fundamental level, you can tell that Bookmark by Kiabetsu is very slapdash and amateur, and I don't mean that as an insult. Well, okay, I can't say I'm a huge fan of the chip through the synth that drives the main motif of the song, frustratingly enough, but, like, that's such a small part of a song that goes through so many different ideas in such a short time that it's hard to keep up. Though, I also get the impression that the artist is a drum producer first, everything else second, because man, those drums go so hard in so many different ways. <laughs> Like, man, I want to get this good at drum sequencing. So cool. Drums is a lead instrument for already the second time in this video. And that's not to discredit the rest of the tune. The fluttery and glitchy synth loops that come in later on sound way better and only add to the colorful, chaotic nature of the song. There's just so many moving parts here that I don't have time to get bored by any of them. I'm kind of fascinated by this one, even if I can't say I fully love it either. It's definitely charming, though. And our next song up is something I guess I shouldn't be surprised exists, but had never really pondered the possibility of. A black metal parody band. <laughs> Like, not in the sense that Olnik is making fun of the genre or anything. No, they're playing the sound completely straight on Chris Winter, Dot of My Night Moon, but using it to accentuate the kind of inherent goofiness of black metal. Cause, I mean, like, I've listened to those old over records, and the angry imp vocals, the grim dark aesthetics, the scuzzy production, the high fantasy lyrics, it's all kind of silly, isn't it? So playing into that in an incredibly self-aware way? Friggin' brilliant if you ask me. <laughs> And it really commits to its old school black metal style, which works both in its favor, helping it stand out in the crowded field, and to its detriment. Some of the ways it stands out, the synth and organ choices, the production fidelity, are part of why I don't really listen to this kind of black metal. Way more into the colder cosmic side of the genre, personally. Though there's more than enough going on here beyond just raw black metal that makes it plenty interesting. It's still a really cool listen, just not quite what I'm looking for in the genre. <laughs> And frick it, let's keep the black metal train a rolling. Yes, 
Well, I mean, kind of. On Memento, Strawberry Hospital are playing post-hardcore first and foremost, just with black metal guitar textures. But it's a genre fusion I find plenty interesting, and kind of amusing, all things considered. And I like this more than I would have liked either of these sounds on their own, so... Sparkly synths and poppy vocals over jagged lo-fi guitar sounds like it shouldn't work, but yeah, it's pretty cool. It's also a, a rough draft of that hybrid. <laughs> Like, for one, the vocals on the chorus are not mixed right. I want to hear those growls more, man. Or, like, at all. And it's also way too short. It's literally just intro, verse, chorus, outro, done. That's it. That's the entire song. Develop your ideas a bit more, guys. I think there's a good concept here, and I like the tune itself a lot, but it leaves me craving for both more polish and more substance than what we got. Alright, and up next we've got... <laughs> That's so true, besties. Can we hear that again? <laughs> you Suffer by Napalm Death poses an interesting question, one that scholars have been pining over for millennia. Why do we suffer? What inherent value is there to suffering? And if there is a god, why would he choose to let us suffer? Nature is cruel, the world is inherently unfair, and there must be some reason for that, right? But You Suffer both asks and answers that question, and I don't think it gets enough credit for that. <laughs> The answer is... who cares? You suffer is but a fleeting thought, one that passes as soon as you notice it. There's no point lingering on the question and wasting away trying to answer it, when all you're really doing is suffering over suffering itself. It's a question not meant to be answered, and that in of itself is the answer. It's not worth worrying about, so just go on and live your life without asking what life itself is demanding out of you. Cause it isn't. <laughs> also, it is a really good bit, you gotta admit. <laughs> They finally did it. Someone finally asked the question, what if a post-hardcore song was a little bit evil? And the answer is pretty nifty. Like, being honest, Knee Deep in the Squan Spog of Nagatuck is just a fairly normal 2000s post-hardcore song. Honestly, it's so mellow and mathy, I almost want to call it Midwest Emo instead. That just goes on weird tangents every so often. Mod Flato's Conspiracy, The Progenitors of Hillbilly Core. Which, like, this was always going to be something I was going to enjoy on a fundamental level, and having that bit of weirdness gives it flavor and personality. Having said that, I... Hmm... Like, you know me by now. I like my hardcore to have a lot more bite to it. Sharper, heavier riffs, more tempo and intensity, and most importantly, killer hooks, which I don't really think this song has. And like, outside of its weirder moments, it's stunningly normal. Almost makes those moments of intrigue feel out of place because the rest of the song sounds dime a dozen. But given that this is just a sound I like, I still enjoy this plenty. Just not as much as I want to, I suppose. Before we get to this next song, I would be remiss not to mention the translation of the song's title, which is I don't wanna get out of bed. Big mood, partner. Big mood. <laughs> This song by that artist is the kind of song I can only really describe as Nyango Starcore. That's a very specific but completely inarguable reference, I think. Uh, screw it, here's Nyango Star. <laughs> But you see what I mean, right? The juxtaposition of something cute and overtly childish against something decisively not. In this case, Lazy Reggae that slams head first into a hardcore punk song, which is something I think makes for a funny gimmick more than a song I, you know, enjoy listening to, cause like, once you get the bit, that's really all it has to it, but... <laughs> Though, despite the verses and the LOUD GROWLS being by far the most memorable parts of the tune, it's that upbeat pop punky chorus that I'm really here for. It's fun, it's catchy, the vocal trade-offs absolutely rule, can feel the dude's screams deep in my soul, man. And it's prominent enough that it can in fact carry the song on its own. And while, yeah, something's definitely getting lost in translation, the struggle to get out of bed in the morning is absolutely real. Possibly the most relatable song in this entire video. <laughs> Before we continue, dear viewer, I've got a question to ask you. Who the hell is Edgar? Well, 
Well, he's Edgar Allan Poe, and he's a ghost, and he possessed Taya and or Selena, and now he's writing their songs. Cartoon shenanigans ensue. Yeah, this is a song that's weird more in premise than in sound. It's pretty much just a normal dance pop tune with a few quirky moments thrown in. Hell, this was played at Eurovision, which is incredibly funny when you consider that the song's a giant middle finger to the music industry. There's a ghost in my body and he is a lyricist. It is Edgar Allan Poe and I think he can resist. Like, Edgar Allan Poe is a ghost writing songs. He's a ghost writer. Brilliant. And yet, despite being literally one of the most famous writers of all time, pinning modern masterpieces for Taya and Selena by the dozens, zero dot zero zero three. Give me two years and you then know I'll be free they're still barely seeing any money for it, because the industry underpays both its artists and its writers unless they're the biggest of the big stars. It's never been about quality, only popularity. And so, like, getting up on stage at Eurovision, a literal popularity contest, and singing this song in particular for the entire world, all while being intentionally weird and quirky to smuggle its deeper meaning under everyone's noses? Genius. What a power play. Oh, and for the record, they came in 15th place in the finals, which isn't, like, half bad at all if I do say so myself. This song's definitely elevated up this high in my rankings just for its content and context, because it's a perfectly fine, pretty catchy little pop tune besides all that, but I am at least a little bit obsessed with it and its story, so it's living rent-free in my head and I ain't gonna be a brain landlord about it. Oh, and as it turns out, Edgar isn't the only Eurovision 2023 song in this set. Or, well, Gladiator probably should have been at Eurovision 2023, but Jan got kind of screwed by rigged voting, and there was a whole scandal about it I don't feel like digging into, because it's not all that relevant. Except, psych, yes it is. Take a wild guess at what Gladiator is about. Like, wouldn't it be funny if there were two Eurovision songs that both primarily featured harpsichord and gospel choirs and were also secretly pointing critiques of the music industry? One hell of a two-nickel scenario we've got here, huh? Ever been to Though, where Edgar was more concerned about the monetary aspect, Gladiator is a shout at the culture. Pitting artists against each other for the entertainment of the masses, turning art into a competition where the only way to win is to step all over and backstab everyone else to get to the top, because the last man standing takes some of the biggest piece of the pie. This becomes incredibly funny when you consider what exactly Eurovision is. Take it till you make it, Moscow never take it off with the red and if it's not true, whatever you think it's a bitch, not true. Oh, and, like, the tune itself is really cool, too. Love the synths on this, the driving groove, the dark atmosphere, just the kind of sound that makes my brain happy. Though I don't think Gladiator is quite as catchy or as cleverly written as Edgar, but it is the one I enjoy listening to more, which, at the end of the day, is the only thing that really matters here, so... And before you say anything, yes, I am completely aware of the extreme irony in pitting these two songs against each other. What can I say? I crave violence. <laughs> Good news, everyone! Our next song is better than The City by Jockstrap. Cipher, er, pronounced Cipher, which is what the title means in Azerbaijani, which, oh, okay. Andreas Holz is a German band, one of the few languages I can immediately recognize just based on how it sounds, and anyways, that's besides the point, because the gimmick of the song seems to be a countdown sort of deal, ending off in a boom? I, I don't really know. I can't even find the lyrics to this one, but I do know one thing for certain. This rocks. Like, we've got some kind of weirdo proggy folk metal thing going on here with some pretty sick driving riffs paired with some gnarly and unhinged vocals from both singers, and it's just so cool. I mean, I personally like my rockers a bit faster pace than this, and the song kind of grinds to a halt in the middle. <sighs> But it's got more than enough weird swings paired with just being a really solid tune that it's still plenty enjoyable to listen to despite my gripes. You rock it, weirdo folk band, just the way I like it. Yo, listen up, here's a story about a little guy that. Oh, 
So, Jaden Smith made a 13 minute magnum opus. I guess that's a thing that exists now. Like, blue is money in song form. It sounds like money, but man, it's a pretty cool use of that money. Lots of little movements to this one. Plenty of really awesome moments of production brilliance, and also Jaden Smith is there too, I guess. Girl, I'm on Luther, Martin Luther King. Life is hard, I'm Kama Sutra Ing. I'm running through the pain that the youth is being afflicted with. It's just ridiculous. It's like, ridiculous. yeah, he's pretty commented as a performer. He shows a ton of range across these tracks, but, well, a lot of what he's saying feels fairly shallow. Rapping about street violence as if he has any perspective on it, comparing himself to famous black icons like Martin Luther King and Jimi Hendrix. Look, he was still a kid. Not inclined to go too hard on him here, but you don't come to this song for the content, is all I'm saying. Jimmy Hendrix with the shits. Jimmy Hendrix with the shits, I told you. And when I listen to Blue, I get the sense that this is the kind of song Quetico was aspiring to. Immaculately produced, massive and epic in scope, and like of Sisyphus, the production vastly outshines the performer, but like, damn that production though. I think I'm impressed by this more than I enjoy it, and it's not all that weird, but the scope and ambition is what makes it compelling, and there's plenty of moments here that are really damn cool. <laughs> Maybe not all 13 minutes of it, of course. Yeah, the length kind of works against this one. There's moments of brilliance scattered across a sea of competence, but those moments don't feel special enough to warrant its length. Though, I do like how the whole thing comes full circle at the end, makes the whole experience feel pretty cohesive. And if I had to rank the individual parts, uh, use the best, followed by B, then E and L after. That almost spells Abel. That's like a religious reference, right? You won't wake up. Okay, I promise I'll pronounce your name right this time. So here goes, Bijank. Why, thank you, Miss Bjork. I do, in fact, enjoy this song. Haha. <laughs> Anyways, can this become my new once a sub special thing? Songs from specifically Post and no other Bjork album? I think I could live with that. Anyways, I love the bass on this one. It, uh, prickles my spine just right. I I'm trying to find new ways to say I like how a thing sounds. It's a very particular kind of enjoyment where I, like, feel it physically. The rest of the tune's cool, too, lumbering and off kilter, but it's the bass that makes it almost, like, scary. <laughs> Which is fitting because Enjoy is, uh, it turns the concept of sex into, like, a horror film. Bjork wants loving without touching, but knows that isn't how love is expressed amongst the average person, and feels apprehensive and nervous about her love because of that. What I'm trying to say is, this song is an asexual anthem, don't at me. So yeah, this not only does it for me on a musical level, but a lyrical level too, given, you know, reasons. Kinda wish it had more of a hook, or really any sort of melodic aspect to it at all. It doesn't stick in the brain quite as much as Hyper Ballad did, but I'm nitpicking at what is a really good tune I find deeply relatable. Uh, I prefer Red Curry myself, but you do you, buddy. Honestly, this one's just kinda cute. That bright little guitar line especially. Though the lyrics hint at something less cute. More anxious and afraid than anything. And then, you know, the chorus happens. <laughs> Yeah, I sort of feel weird reducing this song to its weirdness because there's something vulnerable at its core, a depiction of inner turmoil and the constant fear that you're hurting the ones you love the most without even realizing it. The duality of the mumble mouth verses and the unhinged violent chorus, an excellent depiction of how much those feelings can tear you up on the inside. And like, I love how the tune breaks down the further it goes on, having those dark thoughts intrude on what's supposed to be the calm between the storms, yet the whole thing is surprisingly catchy. Yes, even the screaming. I am that bird. It's a cool tune. Also, I'd be remiss not to mention that in researching this song, I found out that it gets used a lot in AMVs and oh would you look at that. <laughs> Yeah, I see, y'all. This kind of stuff is great, by the way. Send me more of it. Thanks. High-pitched guitar skills and punk breakdowns? For me, how romantic. Jeez. 
shield for your eyes, a beast in the well on your hand by Melt Banana, huh? Yeah, I guess if a banana was melting, it'd sound like this. What? what Anyways, I'm gonna lead with me being a bit annoying for a bit. One thing I find is that I don't really like punk sounds much when it's just bass and drums with no guitar. Always feels empty. And there's a few parts of this song where that's definitely true. The verses and the vocals hit a lot better when they have that wailing guitar behind them and not just the bass and drums. Which, speaking of... <laughs> One of the few cases where I really wish this song was instrumental because the vocals are a rare breed of actively annoying to me. Just too yelpy and shrill, man. And now that I've done nothing but complain, it's here where I pull back the curtain and reveal that I don't really care that much about any of that because god this rocks. <laughs> Like, any song that gets me reflexively drumming along on my desk has gotta be doing something right, despite any reservations I may have about it. The unhinged punky chaos, the catchy guitar lead, hell, just the guitar in general, absolutely the star of the show here. I can rationalize things I dislike about this song, but then I'm not really doing all that much thinking when I'm actually listening to it, so who cares, man? It just goes too hard to deny. <laughs> In 1968, Philip K. Dick posed the world a question. Do androids dream of cutting a sick rug on the dance floor? Stab text is fascinating because Shohei Amimori has somehow managed to infuse so much life and, well, groove into a genre known for its rigid, mechanical, intentionally lifeless sound. Makes me think of Sweet Trip, except, you know, more fun. Even kinda cute at times. That main melody especially. Yet, there's always a veneer of glitchiness to the tune. The chopped up vocals, the crackling of static, the abrasive breakdowns. <laughs> Honestly, the more I hear this one, the more its little twists and turns pop out at me. It's definitely the kind of music you could study and get a lot out of, but it's also surprisingly smooth to listen to and jam along to. I don't know if it's ever going to be something I love, and it does kind of just meander into this one sound for a while and then just end, but it's really neat and really pleasant. <laughs> Man, huge subspecial for songs that sound like mental breakdowns, huh? Oh yeah, y'all definitely know who Danny Brown is, and it's probably because of Ain't It Funny too. It's the kind of song you hear once and never really forget. And yeah, it was one of the few songs I knew going in was definitely following the assignment. Doesn't even give you time to prepare yourself either, just immediately slams you in the face with discordant brass and doesn't let up even a little for three straight minutes. It's deranged, it's claustrophobic, and it's terrifying in all the best ways. Ain't it funny how it happened? I'm coming heavy, trying to say to me, slow down. Which, for a song about living a self-destructive lifestyle where you don't even realize how badly you're messing yourself up, trapped in an ever-worsening cycle that leaves you spiraling down into an endless void, like, yeah, of course it sounds like this. Of course it's repetitive, oppressive, desperate. Granted, I'd love if it did a bit more than Bounce Between It's Two Ideas, but like, I, I get that, it's the point. Like, this is a three minute song, but it feels so much longer. And again, that's on purpose, it knows exactly how long to run without overstaying its welcome. Not sure I'm ever going to love, love it, but I respect the hell out of it, and it's the kind of fricked up music I absolutely need more of in my life. Now that I've successfully brute forced number 23 into meme status, I'm sure y'all are curious what I put at number 23 in this ranking. Well... I mean, it was never gonna be any other song, was it? It's probably stupid as hell to have this thing so high in my ranking, but you have to understand that I have exactly the right kind of brainworm for gamers don't die. Despite not being a zoomer, the generation it's obviously spawned from. On the other hand, some of y'all might be surprised I didn't put Zave higher here, given how much I liked Jane Remover last time. Cause this is basically just the same song, except both more and less hinged, right? Well, I mean, Can You Tell was really beautiful even in its madness. Gamers Don't Die is just pure trollish chaos with no real, you know, emotion behind it. And it's like two minutes long. Probably the least substantive song in this entire set. Also, uh, it it's Lucid Dream's Nightcore. I still see 
with meme sound effects running for good measure, too. Which, like, my gut instinct is I'm too goddamn old for this, but, like, it is pretty funny. And I'm predisposed to like what is essentially the extreme metal version of Hyperpop, so pretty sense and overpowering bass go brr. It goes hard, man. Embrace the chaos, I say. <laughs> There's been a fair few songs on this list I've described as brain tickling or spine tingling or what have you. Here's the best of them. Like, there's probably a lot I could say about If I Had a Heart, but Fever Ray is up this high because they, or rather, they, singular, NBs Rise Up, found some really good bass synths and layered them perfectly. The vibes are just immaculate, man. Goosebumps every time I listen to it. I just love how this sounds. Th that's really it. That's the entire review. Well, fine, if you insist. Uh, this song is apparently rated from the perspective of death itself, which would explain why it sounds so spooky and bleak. And it was, uh, used as the theme song for the History Channel's Vikings. So, yeah, that's neat. I, look, y'all, I got nothing else to say about this one. I'm just here to get lost in the vibes. Gonna go, like, take a bird bath in that base or something. Yeah. <laughs> more like, more like, more like Perilous. I probably should have used that non-joke when I actually covered Paramore. Anyways, Paramore, spelled with a U, by Anna Meredith, who seems to be like some kind of musical wizard if this song is any indication. Like, this song is cool first and foremost, enjoyable second, but I am not immune to cool Aganda, and by God is this so damn cool. Like, the way the tune goes from rigid and mechanical to so organic and full of life the longer it goes on is so cool. From synths to guitars to a full-on orchestra, and every step of the journey is just delightful to listen to. Feels like it has a lot of the same intentions as Bookmark did, albeit using very different sound palettes, and, well, I like the sound palette a lot more, so... Like, yeah, there's an extent to which it feels a bit clinical, this doesn't really make me feel much, but when the entire ride is this enjoyable, when it does so much and goes so hard in so many places, man, who cares? And the rest of the album was pretty dang nifty too, definitely worth a listen if this song sounds like your thing. Hmm, is it weird to say I'm kinda disappointed by this next song? Like, okay, Dirty Boy is good. I like it a lot, obviously. But, well, I know just how weird cardiacs can get. But, like, on the flip side, I like Dirty Boy a lot more than this, so... And it's not like theatrical maximalist prog rock is exactly the most normal thing out there, either. Plus, like previously stated, man, I love how this sounds. Sheer maximalism and bombast, hell yes, I eat that stuff up. Though I will admit I'm a bit baffled by the lyrics, which seem to be intentionally broken and malformed to the point of incomprehensibility. <laughs> I've read interpretations that it's about a soldier or about jacking off, and like, if I squint, I can kinda see both, but I'm mostly suspecting it's gibberish on purpose to confuse overly serious music analysts, which is a pretty good prank, to be fair. There's surprisingly little to say about this one, though, because like, yeah, there are subtle shifts the whole way through, but on the whole, this may be the most one-note song in this entire set, and I mean, it does have one note at the end. <laughs> And I really like its one note, both the literal one and the metaphorical one. Maybe I didn't need nine whole minutes of it, but I ain't really complaining either. I'm not loving it as much as the, like, near-universal claim I've seen cardiacs get amounts prog nerds, but this song at least gets a thumbs up for me. <laughs> Guys, music is so cool. Like, Cock and Rolla is in a similar lane as Paramore, honestly, and that this is just cool more than anything, but Beg the Grad provides a lot more of a human touch to their music that makes me like it just that little bit more. Or maybe it's just because this kind of dissonant, atonal prog rock folk 
thing is just way more up my alley. This and Cypher also have a lot in common, but this one's just got so much more going on. So many little twists and turns that keep me constantly captivated. <laughs> And I want to say that it's not quite tuneful enough to completely do it for me, but then it's also so chaotic and, frankly, fun that I kind of want to listen to it several times in a row every time I spin it, so there's that. Frankly, I feel like I still haven't listened to this quite enough times to fully unpack it, but that really just excites me more than anything. Give me a few hundred more listens, and I'll probably tell you this is one of my favorite songs of all time, but just outside grey tier is good enough for now, I think. Right, okay, this next segment is gonna get a bit heavier than I'd like for this video, but we're gonna try and scratch around the worst of it here. So, without further ado, Lingua Ignata. Lingua Ignata is an artist who should be right at my alley. Sheer musical maximalism paired with overwhelming emotions, but I don't know, something has never quite clicked for me. That is to say, her cover of Jolene may be the most I've liked anything I've heard from her. I don't really know how to describe this as anything other than death country, which is something that my guess exists now. Maybe I'm just a sucker for guitars. Makes me wish she worked with them more often. Your beauty is beyond compare with flaming locks of auburn hair. And while I don't think this cover makes the original Jolene any more or less gay, uh, if you know who Lingua Ignata is and what she's been through, let's just say hearing her wail out, please don't take my man a half dozen times is uncomfortable to say the least. Really, a lot of her music has to be filtered through that same lens, which makes it very hard to listen to and even harder to talk about. If you know, you know. But that's why this is such a grueling listen, man. He's the only one for me, Joe. Though, considering the whole song is just this for six whole minutes, you'd think it'd get a bit tedious after a while, but her performance kind of just carries the whole thing, for better or worse. But here's the thing, this song is a lot. It's one of, if not the only song here, whose appeal hinges entirely on emotional response, and I'm not really in the mood for that kind of listening when going through, you know... <laughs> an entire set of that kind of music, but that's absolutely not a knock against this song. I complain so much about covers, you better believe I'm gonna praise the hell out of one done really damn well, but it's also the kind of song I respect way more than I ever want to actually, like, listen to it, which is probably going to be never again once this video goes up. Charlie. As we enter the top third of this ranking, one thing I've noticed is that there's like lots of pairs in this set. Two songs doing a lot of the same things, one ranking somewhat low, the other much higher. Cypher and Cock and Roll will come to mind, and there's plenty more to come too, but our next song brings to mind Apricot, specifically in how heavily it leans into the uncanny side of Vocaloid. Also, it slaps. Funnily enough, I was actually aware of Ghost and Pals before Scapegoat. Honey, I'm Home in particular, which is honestly even better, but the former's still a jam and a half, too. They have this way of, like, injecting a really fun amount of overly cartoonish evilness into their tunes that's still a good bit creepy even in spite of its silliness. Spooky core if I've ever heard it. I'll put you up here in my drink tonight, tonight I'm chewing up and spitting out your... As for the tune itself, it's like, what if Surf Rock was a little bit evil? As a treat. I guess it's also like Mod Flanders Conspiracy in that way, but the band I actually think of most when listening to this is Hail Spirit Noir from that time when they lean into the joke of black metal is just Surf Rock with distortion, a hill I am also willing to die on because it's really funny. Not really a ton else to say about Scapegoat because it's kind of just a jam. Sure, it's not as maximalist or unsettling as Honey, I'm Home, but it's way more fun, and I'm more than willing to just have fun alongside it. So no, I do not hate you. And the speed up at the end? Perfect. No notes. Alright, and now time for something less evil. We've got... Oh, huh, the telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? Yes, I am in fact one of those sickos. Well, the telephone is ringing. Is that my mother on the phone? In 1983, the police released the album Synchronicity, which contained the track Mother, a song so good they realized they were never gonna top it and probably never released music ever again. Truly going out on top. Honestly, music itself peaked with this song, and it's been a slow decline ever since. Mother by the Police, the best song of the 80s? It's more likely than you think. Wait. 
which it's very interesting that this and Cock and Rollo, the two most atonal songs of this entire bunch, are also both from the 80s, a decade of music most known for its polish and tightness. Maybe I just like subversions, and yes, of course, I also love how deranged this one sounds. It's like one of the first punk and hardcore songs to ever use this style of dissonant guitar needling, and it's also in 7-8 time, so it's kind of amazing that this comes from the Every Breath You Take band on the same album, and everyone hates it for being too good. Yeah. Or just too ahead of its time. A real, your kids are gonna love it moment for the ages. Also, this song is about trauma, right? From having an overbearing mother who's affected his romantic relationships ever since, and how crazy that drives him. But also, it's the funny, wacky, crazy police song, so I'm not really thinking about any of that when I'm listening to the tune itself, anyways. All cops are still bastards, though, and don't you forget it. Guys, I am so tired. Okay, look, I get it. Dreamhouse by Death Heaven is not something you hear every day. Emphasis on the you, because boy howdy is this another one that just does not phase me at all. Yup. That's Dreamhouse by Death Heaven, all right. Pretty good black gaze. Am I becoming Ariana Grande? Because listening to this song makes me go, yes, and? Here's my review of Dreamhouse. Have y'all ever heard of I'll Say? Or Midnight Odyssey? Ooh, you should check out Spectral Lore. Ron, perchance? Honestly, I could keep going all day here, and that's about even getting into the more abrasive sides of atmospheric black metal. What I'm trying to say is, Death Heaven is so passe to me, y'all. Like, I'm not gonna lie to y'all and say this isn't still really damn good. It's pretty dang close to the platonic ideal of music, which is, again, Midnight Odyssey. Go check out my top 10 albums of 2023 video for more details on that, but... Death Heaven has a reputation as baby's first black metal for a reason, is all I'm saying. Do the deeper dive into this scene, y'all. I promise you'll find it rewarding. I know I sure did. <laughs> Oh, Liz, you know me too well. Like, this is practically cheating. A fact of life, by fact, from life. Just some good quality post-hardcore. With a good bit of synth integration, in fact. Checked out this album and it was even synthier than I expected. And this one's a great case study in why exactly Bob Flinders Conspiracy didn't quite work for me. There's just more energy here, stronger melodies, a lot more punch to the guitars. I want my punk music to rock, man. Lyrically, it pretty much just seems to be a breakup song, albeit in kind of broken English, but there's something endearing about that in a weird way. Like, so the band is Japanese, but it feels like they were big fans of the American emo and post-hardcore scene in the 2000s and wanted to make their own music along those lines. So you get the same general sound, the same type of lyrics, but it still stands out just because of their own unique style as outsiders to that scene. Outside of that, like, yeah, this is laser targeting a sound I already know I like, though it kind of lacks for surprises and also, uh, much of a hook. It's plenty melodic, but way less catchy than I expected. And it's, like, sitting pretty normal amongst the general weirdness of the rest of these songs, but, uh, good music's good music, and this, this is good music. That's a fact you can trust. Ooh, spooky number 13. Well, can I pause? Satan. The next song's about Satan. The donkey-headed yada yada yada, that, that's just the devil. He's the one opening the conversation, about how humanity has fricked up so bad he's come up from hell to judge them. With plagues, mostly. Mmm, some good old-fashioned misanthropy, my favorite. But like, that's besides the point. You're probably asking, what in the ever-loving hell did I just hear? <laughs> Yeah, of every artist here, Sleepy Time and Gorilla Museum may have the least hinges of them all. The sound of this song is just so 
fascinating. Not a single second of this could qualify as normal music. Is it good? I don't know, but when I'm getting swept up in the sheer chaos, the percussive violence, all mixed with the intentionally pretentious concept and presentation, like, I think the question of good or bad is the last thing on my mind. Like, there's no other music that sounds like this. Literally, the band made their own instruments just to make sure of that. You can't buy these sounds. That's dedication. Hands up the soil, take us into the ground. Also, the song has a surprisingly good sense of humor. There's this bit towards the end where they start listing off all the plagues the devil is inflicting upon humanity and then follow it up with... saying nothing and then hitting us with a hell of a punchline and it just has me in shambles every time. I'm still not sure how much I like this and the first time I heard it I had genuinely no clue what to make of it. But I think being compelling is just as if not more important than purely being good and I'm sure I'm going to be thinking about this song for years to come. <laughs> Okay, so a funk metal slash prog rock slash jazz My Little Pony song exists, and there's nothing any of us can do about that. All right, sure. Phase one. Yeah, if I made a list of the coolest things to ever exist, I could see this placing at number 15. Or higher. Probably top 10, honestly. Croon Pony has given us something. Like, okay, I've heard all of these different sounds before, but not like together in these specific ways. It's genuinely progressive music in a way very little modern rock or metal has been. Trust me, I would know. Phase two. <laughs> Like, have you ever heard a flute rip a shred guitar solo over the best bass like Primus never wrote? I certainly friggin' haven't. We'd be here all day if I picked apart every single last little awesome moment of this song. There's way more than 15. But one thing I do want to point out is all the different ways that one bass lick gets reused and recontextualized into so many different parts of the song. I love that kind of leitmotif. And drawing yet another arbitrary comparison, this song has a lot in common with the slower parts of that Mel Banana song. Except instead of getting faster, it just gets weirder and cooler. 20% cooler, if you will. <laughs> See, I could do pony memes too. This song's just a hell of a ride that I absolutely recommend checking out for yourself. It's impossible for me to do this thing justice in this short little segment, but it is so cool. What's your favorite emote? Mine's gotta be, uh, ooh. Yeah, that one, Eepy Slugcat. You know, one of my resolutions this year is to use this emote more often. So just like, imagine one of them at the end of everything I say. It's kind of hard to like speak emotes though. There's some easy ones like owu and uwu, but then you've got, uh, shoosh. by Yule, who this isn't their usual thing from my experience. I actually spun this album a few times last year and a lot of it's more mellow and vibey than anything. Not a full on rock song like this. And pairing their cutesy doll aesthetic and voice of a song that goes this hard, well, that does make it stand out. Like they just absolutely go for it here. Chills, man. Your favorite TikTok soft girl could never. I want to hear an entire Yule Screamo album just on the basis of this song. Jesus Christ. Like, yeah, much like the rest of the album, this is still a bit undercooked. All of one verse and one chorus, but... <laughs> An escalating build of roaring guitars and shrill synths fighting it out, threatening to smother each other until the whole song falls apart under the pressure? Yeah, man, when the song sounds this good, goes this hard, makes me want to scream along, any of my nitpicks kind of get pushed to the back of my mind. Ooh, yeah, slay, NB Queen. Fweet! But it's still not quite the best hardcore song here. So go and tell your you know, I think you and Anaria should work together sometime. Best collab of the decade waiting to happen right there. For real, for real. Monstar is literally just broke inside if they were a good band. That's it. That's the tweet.
Okay, no, but for real. Every part of my brain screams at me that this song is the lamest kind of scene core schlock out there, too stupid to even acknowledge, annoying and bratty in all the ways I hate, but like, my body is too busy rocking out to really care about what my dumb brain thinks. Idiot. Really though, I'm all for annoying music that knows it's annoying without leaning so far into it that it becomes insufferable. It's fun, and it crushes. <laughs> Like, Jesus Christ, girls rock, hell yeah. You know, I feel like this is the kind of trash in music Kesha Circa 2012 would've made if she'd gotten into metalcore. No, even more than that, it's like the bridge between hyperpop and metalcore that I'm honestly surprised hasn't been explored more, edgycore. Makes me nostalgic for a scene I was never a part of and also never, uh, liked. Drop an oxy feeling foxy, thick eyeliner like I'm boxy, blocked your number, dropped your doxy, bricked your iPhone, hacked your posse. Which, yeah, there's so much about this I should hate. Bratty valley girl inflections, mindless modern metalcore tropes, the incessant hammering of the chorus, but because they're all meshed together in such a colorful way, because it goes so goddamn hard, it wraps all the way back around to working? It's modest and self-indulgent, <laughs> on purpose, and I kinda respect that, like, a lot. Though it also helps that it's just the catchiest song of this entire set. Truly a monster of a hook. Also, like, the lyrics are great. Did I point that out yet? Basically just A, B, C, D, E, F, U, but more. Petty and juvenile, but oh so cathartic. This dude sounds like the worst person you know, and by the end of the song, Inari has destroyed him so violently, he's more unrecognizable than if he took a trip through a jet engine. Delightful. Hope this girl becomes a superstar. She absolutely deserves it. Oh, by the way, yeah, a little late, but welcome to the top 10, where we have some of the weirdest, wildest music you're gonna hear today, and also a member of NSYNC. Which, okay, first off, wait a minute, this song was in DDR. Under a different name, mind you, simply being loved instead of its real title, Somnambulist. But that, like, automatically gives it points in my book. Points it didn't need because it's great. Turns out, legendary electronic artist BT is just good at making music. Who knew? And this is just a killer pop song, with Jay-Z Chaz as on vocals. Don't worry, it it's fine. Boyband.exe is just a bit glitchy at the moment. What I've been finding in a lot of my exploration of the genre is that I don't like glitch pop so much as pop that is glitchy. It needs to be a pop song first and foremost. It's gotta have the tune, gotta have the hook, gotta have the groove, but still have those interesting electronic elements that make it sound like it's malfunctioning. It's a hard balance to maintain, but this song does it pretty much flawlessly. The kind of dance pop that forces you out of your seat to jam along to it. That also happens to have <coughs> 6,178 vocal edits, making BT the holder of a Guinness World Record that nobody is really all that interested in challenging. His mother is very proud. Really, it's just that little bit of extra flavor on top of an already good song that helps it stand out. Not among the rest of this top 10, mind you, but, well, it's it's trying. Bit of a zebra amongst unicorns problem is all. Great song regardless. You're really gonna make me review this one in this video of all things, huh? Okay, so how this shit happen? Your ass is now rapping, I guess we can make that work. The money is stacking as long as you snapping. No, okay, I guess it's got perks. Make a Poet Black is so hard for me to talk about because it's like, it's McKinley Dixon wrestling with whether or not his life is worth writing songs about. Has he been through enough pain and death to tell an interesting story? Or does he need to embellish his lived experiences to make them more relatable? After all, poets lie too. What if we made it a little bit more, mm, think about it like this. You not the realest, you know that, right? They not gonna feel this, you know that, right? And all the while, in the midst of mourning the death of a close friend, having to question whether any one person can really be blamed for killing another, can be blamed for the violence inherent to the black experience in America, or if it's a systemic problem that goes beyond any of them that they're all really victims of. Blow my damn money, all the niggas girl. Whole block running through the streets. Chrome on the cover, her shit the corner. And it's all backed up by a tune that goes so many places in so little time. Is borderline cinematic in its swells, practically an entire movie condensed to four mere minutes. Like, this is his best song, right? Right? If I was really sad, I'd put this shit to my head. Cause fuck a double entendre, my nigga is.
really, I'm doing this song a service by including it in this kind of video at all because there's way too much to unpack here that I am simply not equipped for, nor do I really have the time to do so in this segment. And I'm doing it a disservice by putting it this low. Yes, number 8 is way too low, I know, but it's not exactly all that re-listenable because it's just so much. Facing something like this is meant to be uncomfortable though, so don't hang the preacher. You're not the realest, you know that right? God damn, do I need something fun and lighthearted after that last one. Hit me, Yabadum. Never been without an idea what's good for me. Oh yeah, All the Funs is cool. It's like a prog rock song from the late 60s or early 70s slammed into a groovy jazz fusion song that then turns into a twee indie rock song from around the turn of the millennium. I like that first half more, admittedly. It's one of the more faithful and fun classic prog rock speeches I've heard. A lot of bands tap into the more self-serious side of the genre, where this goes for the looser, groovier side. The stuff for the dorks rather than the nerds. It's cute. When and now I just return to what feels safe. And yet, there's an undercurrent of melancholy throughout the song, and also the more I listen to it, anger. It's like explicitly a song about nostalgia, and how as children we were all told we could be anything we wanted, only to be denied that because in reality, all the wealth has aggregated to old selfish pricks who refuse to give any of it up, leaving the rest of us stuck longing for better days when life was easier. And that's filtered through throwback sounds to emphasize that nostalgia, and gonna be real y'all, this is the only song here that made me tear up once or twice. It's surprisingly heavy. Oh, it hurts to look at the Like, there's at least some part of me that thinks this should top this list, but, well, it's, again, just not that type of video, and I'm not always in the right kind of emotionally vulnerable mindset to appreciate it in that way. And yet, even when it's not leaving me an emotional wreck, the tune itself is strong enough that I can enjoy the hell out of it on that front, too. It's just fun music. Bittersweet, perhaps, but sweet all the same. <laughs> Gonna be real, y'all. I've got virtually nothing to say about this next song other than that it's just so goddamn cool. Ooh, yeah. Focus is like exactly the kind of music I want more of in my life right about now. Dancing, percussive, and dynamic is all hell. Hell yeah. So cool. All music should aspire to be this goddamn cool, honestly. Shame on all other music ever for not going this hard. Bell Sasaki confirmed the GOAT of all time. Okay, actual review mode engaged for a minute. Turns out that grounding this kind of song on one good melody goes a long way. You have something to latch onto while everything else around it is mostly bass and percussion. And the groove switch up out of left field towards the end, just icing on the cake. Mmm, delicious. Focus. And that's about everything insightful I have to say about this one. Sorry, too busy grooving along to think right now. Get back to me in a few minutes. Oh yeah, just so cool. And now for something that's uh, much less fun. I was actually a little hesitant to include Goodbye, and not just because it's, you know, 17 minutes long, but because, uh, on the topic of Sewer Slut, her whole shtick was basically just being a giant edgeward for the sake of, ahem, exploring the ugliness of the human experience, and that manifested in some very not okay ways that I don't feel like delving into, but, well, Goodbye sees her having to face the reality of that ugliness head on, and not being able to handle it, forcing her to be emotionally earnest for once in her life, and then logging off after, and I think there's power to that. The song and the album it's from was written in the wake of Sewer Sluts, Junes as I'd rather prefer to call her, in the wake of her girlfriend's suicide, as a tribute to her and a farewell to her own internet presence and music career as a whole. And it manifests as a tune that's as melancholic and mournful as it is celebratory, trying to capture who she was, what she made June feel. Yet, as with all things, those memories, those feelings fade away with time.
which I get why the song slowly becomes less over time. It's thematically appropriate, but it does mean the song gets less engaging the more it goes on. Five minutes of truly excellent, upbeat, beautiful breakcore, five more minutes of slower but still colorful drum and bass, and then seven minutes of lush ambient. It's at least ten minutes of absolutely euphoric music, and the last seven minutes being kind of just fine can't take that away, but it does make the song hard to come back to, in more than just the obvious way. I'm still not sure I'm fully on board with this one, but man, I can't deny there's something special here, and I hope June's doing okay now. So, y'all ready for some whiplash? Because this next song may well be the stupidest song in this entire video. Wait, Crow, what are you talking about? This is really pretty. Shh, shh, no. See, this is what we in the business call a bait and switch. There's something delightfully devilish about taking such a lovely melody and doing this to it. Exactly my kind of brainworms. And they're coming for you. It's too late. They're already here. Like, Kaboom is just every stupid sample tea puzzle I could find all piled up on top of each other like the world's most overindulgent pizza. It's just so funny. <laughs> Oh, also, it goes hard as hell. Like, even once you've heard the song enough times for the jokes to wear off, you still got an absolute banger of a song. But, Crow, you're over exaggerating. This doesn't go that hard. To Stop. Piano time. If you aren't losing your mind by the time this song really pops off, I don't wanna know you. Sorry, turns out I'm Ariana Grande again and we can't be friends. That's the line that's gonna date this video. Unlike this song, which is absolutely timeless, transcends the concept of temporality entirely, has always existed and will continue to exist long after the heat death of the universe. Kaboom goes the sun, yet the magic lives on. This song is a miracle and a blessing and you will be telling all your friends about it. Pull to a nation, rise up. In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except speed core, furries, and hoobastank. And oh, you better believe I'm on my furry BS about Bandetto. Scale the skyscraper friendship and Kaboom make a great pair, actually, because they're like both halves of stable tape rooms extracted into their own songs. Kaboom gets the pure stupidity, and Skyscraper gets the sheer unhinged energy. Tip to all electronic music producers, make your bass too loud and then make it work anyways. I, I promise, it's a good idea. For real though, this is just pure ear candy. I love music this extra. I love happy hardcore. And I love how goofy and all over the place this song is while still flowing so buttery smooth start to finish. Too many fun little moments to even highlight them all here. <laughs> This song's just really cute for how feral it is. It's bouncy, it's silly, it's also really dang gender, but like in an it its way. My gender is cartoon animal. No, I'm not sharing. You could call it Nightcore Plus, you could call it Hyperpop before Hyperpop was even a thing, but I'm just gonna call it gender. I'm also gonna call it surprisingly emotional. <laughs> Like, there's something melancholic to the messaging here, which is, again, sampled from the guys who made this song. I'm not a person. I never do things. But like, setting these lyrics to something more explicitly queer-coded and not playing up the sappiness of it, making it actually sound bittersweet instead of just saccharine and oversold, and making it, again, go hard as all hell. Furries just do it better, man. Yeah, of every wild and wacky sound throughout this video, I think this is the kind of stuff I'm most interested in hearing more of. Just so cool. I want to be a pool toy Zoar. Wait, I wasn't supposed to put that in the script. <sighs> Let's talk about gender, baby. Actually, let's not. Gender isn't even real anyways. Oh, by the way, welcome back Karen Drager, aka Fever Ray, aka Half of the Knife, and congrats on being the only repeat artist in this entire set. And conveniently, Full of Fire scratches a lot of the same itches if I had a heart, in the synth textures that really tickle my brain, but it's just so much cooler, so much groovier, and possibly even more unnerving too. Uh, 
Like, it's super hard to explain the exact appeal of this song because, like, you either get it or you don't. It took me a few listens to get it, in fact. This started way down in the ranking and grew on me so much that part of me wants to put it all the way at number one. It just touches on all the weirder aspects of electronic music that I'm way into right now. And it's also, like, very explicitly queer, transgressive at the very least. <laughs> I imagine a lot of people would find this annoying as all hell, but again, I have just the right kind of brainworms for this. It's just so many different layers of electronic noise layered on top of that rigid but constantly evolving groove, a slow burn of a song if I've ever heard one, and nine minutes that pass way too goddamn fast. I want more, man. More. Give me more. Give me more. <laughs> Really, the only disappointing thing about this one is that nothing else on the album was quite as cool, and a lot of it was tedious in the ways Full of Fire avoided being. But then that fact just makes this one incredibly fascinating song all that more special. I want more music to sound like this, though. I need it. My, my gender needs it. Please. <laughs> And yet, at the end of the day, despite all the cool and crazy tunes y'all sent me, I don't think there was really ever going to be anything that was going to overtake the song that's topped the list from the very beginning. They... they made a happy song too. This is the best day of my life. Like, okay, I'm gonna try to avoid constantly comparing the two, because at the end of the day, Throbbing by Die 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 is far from just another happy song. It's a lot more calm and, ironically, or maybe unironically, happier. Honestly, it's really damn beautiful in a lot of places, and yet, in some ways, I almost find it more shocking than happy song. <laughs> Cause, like, Happy Song peaks in insanity pretty early, where the twist is that it actually gets prettier and mellower as it goes on. The only real plot twist is the key change. Throbbing, on the other hand, gets more hecked up and horrifying as it goes on, becoming all but unrecognizable as it crushes you under industrial noise and down-tuned guitars. <laughs> And, like, I'm skimming over so much here for the sake of time because this song goes to so many different places across its runtime. There's an absurd amount of musical ideas crammed into this six minute song, and getting lost and disoriented along the way is kind of just part of the ride it takes you on. Yet, by the end, it all comes full circle, resolving to something truly beautiful. <laughs> Like, Throbbing kind of just has it all. It's catchy, it's unpredictable, it's transcendent, it's just plain cool. I've heard it plenty of times by now, but there's just so much of the song that I still get surprised by something new every single time, and that, that is peak music right there. It's an overwhelming feeling of euphoria, put the music in the most cathartic way possible, and exactly the kind of music I need in my life right now. It's, well, it's Throbbing by Die Die Die, and I think that's wonderful. I've been Crow, and I'll see you all next time. Stay weird, y'all.